Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Marie Latulipe and I'm the Director of Science Programs at the Institute for the Advancement of Food and Nutrition Sciences, or IFINS. And this is the second in our 2021 webinar series that's focused on diet and the impact on the gut microbiome. And just a quick note for anyone that might not be familiar with IFINS, we are a nonprofit scientific organization and we advance food safety and nutrition science for the benefit of the health of the public. And the way we do that is we bring together scientists from government, industry, and academia, and together they decide what the critical research questions are and how to address those. And the way we operate is that we believe including diverse perspectives in discussions is really fundamental to the development of credible science and science that benefits the entire food ecosystem. And with that, just a quick note on logistics. So you should see a control panel on your screen that looks like what you see here. And the orange arrow will allow you to collapse that control panel, but you'll also see a box for questions. So please type your questions in there as we go through the webinar and we'll bring those to Dr. Lindemann at the end. And with that, I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Stephen Lindemann. Dr. Lindemann did his bachelor's work at Purdue University and his PhD at the University of Iowa. He also did a fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and he's a molecular microbial ecologist and a geneticist by training. And he now applies this knowledge in, approach, in an approach to understand the mechanisms of interaction of dietary components, especially dietary fibers, which we'll talk about today, with gut, micro gut microbiota and the impact of all these interactions on health. So with that, Dr. Lindemann, we are pleased to turn the platform over to you. Thanks for the introduction, Maureen. All right. Hopefully that will start now. Okay, yep, so, excellent, that's what I like to hear. So it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the work that I'm currently doing in my lab, uh, working on how dietary fiber structure influences the gut microbiome, and specifically kind of the, the, the salient reference or inspiration for the talk is this uh, the Cherokee legend that involves two wolves being inside of everyone, essentially the good and the evil that compete, and the, the one that wins that competition is the one that gets fed. So I like to draw that inspiration and that analogy to the microbiome because I feel like the same thing is probably true of every human on the planet right now, in that there are negative and, and um, damaging factors to ecosystems of our gut microbiome that could be made prevalent if we give it bad diet. Um, but at the same time, there are positive beneficial aspects to those ecosystems which we could feed into a more beneficial arrangement. So I think that that kind of metaphor gives us a little bit of a starting point for thinking about the microbiome is an ecosystem that we have to control every day by what we choose to put through our digestive tract. And so um, what I'd like to tell you kind of through the, through, through the presentation today is to talk about a few vignettes of how we know that different aspects of dietary fiber structure influence the gut microbiome. And so we'll start here with an introduction to how carbohydrates in general influence the, the colonic ecosystem and thinking about that as an ecosystem um, in kind of our view. So my favorite analogy for how the ecosystem, the gut ecosystem moves is this here, this image of a water molecule moving over 100 hours, which it seems like an odd reference for talking about a diet. But the thing that I really like about this analogy is that you have different magnitudes of a perturbation and you also have different uh, time scales or, or frequencies of that perturbation. So you have very high frequency but low magnitude wave events, which move a molecule back and forth, but only a little bit. And then you have tidal influences that would be moving that molecule on six hour intervals over much longer distances with greater magnitude, but lower frequency. And then you have a current here that's moving the molecule along the entire scope of this, this shoreline here in a directional way. And so I think about that with respect to dietary perturbations because our meals are like, and our dietary habits are like the waves. So we, we're always consuming a variable diet, um, at least mostly in the West we are, and that variable diet moves our microbiome on high frequency and low amplitude. But then we have dietary patterns that exert influence over the gut microbiome structure and function on much larger scales, and but also much, um, much more less frequent scales. 
And then we have the, the scope of an entire life of lifestyle choices that influences how our microbiome develops over time. And so it's in this context that we can understand both uh, the plasticity of the microbiome, how quickly it can change with respect to different dietary perturbations, but at the same time, the idiosyncrasy of that microbiome. So your microbiome's response to the food that you ate may be different from your neighbors. So what we think about a lot in my lab is this intersection between fiber and microbial diversity. And it's because we know that diversity, um, we don't know whether diversity is causal in, in helping us be healthy per se, that, that it still is not quite clear. We do know that low diversity states, some low diversity states at least, tend to be associated with unhealth and specifically with chronic Western diseases that we see rising in prevalence in kind of a scary way. And so, you know, this here is a, an experiment done in the Justin Sonnenberg lab, but then also here diagrammed by Eric Martens, where the Sonnenberg lab uh, gave mice high fiber diets and then let watch transmission from mother to pup of microbiota. And they find that if you maintain uh, mice on a high fiber diet, the, the transfer of those microbes was pretty efficient. And so they didn't see much loss of diversity over sequential generations. But if you have a parallel set of mice raised on a low fiber diet, you saw less and less diversity in the gut microbiome with time. And further, the scarier part is that it was actually much harder to restore those from a dietary change back to the original high fiber diet at sequential generations. Give some, some um, evidence or some inference that there's been an extirpation event or a localized extinction of some microbiome, some microbes in the microbiome in these particular mice, which is kind of scary when, it, when you think about humans because similar impacts could be at play with, for us as well. And so before we get going too far, I'd like to talk about how we measure diversity, just so we make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we measure microbial diversity mostly using this beautiful molecule here. This is the 16S ribosomal RNA. And the reason this is such a great molecule for doing the work is that because it has a secondary structure, there's difference in how these different regions can evolve with time. So if there are you know, mutations in regions that govern the fundamental structure of this molecule, you can assemble a functional ribosome and the organism that receives that mutation is dead. So there's a lot of mutation pressure, a lot, a lot of selective pressure against mutations in certain regions of this molecule, for example. But in other regions, all that's happening with this molecule is it's contacting the ribosomal proteins. So these, these areas here are free to evolve with the ribosomal proteins of an organism. So that means you can end up with a system where we can use the high conservation to amplify uh, using PCR, the regions of wide swaths of the phylogenetic tree of life, using the conserved regions to design primers against. And then in the, in the middle, we have these variable regions, which give us some um, inference of where that molecule came from, where that inference of what species we saw. And so in doing so, um, it's important to note that what we get is just this. We get a microbial name tag that tells us where on the tree of life that microbe originated. But Unfortunately, we don't gain a whole lot with respect to function, and here's why. So the problem is that especially things that we're really interested in, like polysaccharide utilization, varies at really fine taxonomic levels. And so here you're looking at a group of related organisms. This is Eubacterium rectali, which is now Agathobacter rectalis, for those of you who are taxonomists in the group. Um, but also a neighboring species here is Roseburia, and then we have multiple strains of the, that Roseburia. We have Inulinivorans, Intestinalis, Hominis, and um, and phasis. And so the interesting thing about this is we're looking at growth of this organism when given these different carbon sources. So fructooligosaccharide, galactooligosaccharide, xyloligosaccharide, amylopectin, arabinan, beta-glucan, arabinoxylan, arabinogalactan, and inulin. The interesting thing here is that the extent of growth is really dependent not just on the species, but also on the strain level. For example, if we looked at, if we looked at arabinoxylans, for example, our intestinalis uniformly can consume this molecule as a carbon source, although the extent of growth is different among strains. But for erectali here, M10-104-1 can't consume arabinoxylan at all and produce growth. So these kinds of, of patterns show us that there are some really fine variabilities in how function um, actually works at the level of individual species and strains of those species. So, one um, confounding piece of this is that we start with such different initial microbial populations. So this right now, what you're looking at here are data from upper Midwesterners from the Mayo Clinic. And you're looking at their abundances of different microbes at the phylum level, and you're looking at them at the family level. And so 
the goal here is not to get you to squint and read the labels so you understand how these differences um, actually are being manifest, but rather to just look at the patterns and see how different these individuals are in their gut microbiota. And so, you know, just to put this in some context, these are all members of family, uh, sorry, phylum chordata. And as you can see, they're very different in their, in their ecosystem role. They inhabit very different ecosystems and they do very different things and interact very differently with other species. And so, okay, that's phylum, uh, it's big. What about at the family level? Can we get more in terms of function? We can get some more in terms of function. These are all members of family Ursidae and they all have four legs and they all have uh, kind of the same morphology, but again, they have very different food preferences, very different temperature preferences. They inhabit very different ecosystems. And so we can gain very little information about an ecosystem based on how many total members, total types of bears are there. So, um, when we think about that world, we have diverse initial populations, we have um, very strain resolved levels of interactions with dietary components, and we talk about and think about how to maintain diversity in those ecosystems, we have to also keep in mind the ecology that's driving these interactions between organisms. And that fundamentally means that diversity is really hard to maintain in ecosystems, and that's due to what we call an ecology Gauss's law or the law of competitive exclusion, which says that two species that are competing for the same limiting resources can't coexist at stable population sizes, given everything else being constant. And here's kind of the prototypical way that this was first done in context of microbes. This is E. coli C18, or C8 here, and this is a Pseudomonas aeruginosa strain, and they are competing for tryptophan in a chemostat. So they're working, uh, both of these organisms are growing together, competing for that tryptophan. And even though the Pseudomonad actually is able to produce more biomass, it's able to grow more rapidly than the E. coli, the E. coli ends up winning this competition. And the way it does so is because it has a higher affinity for the substrate. It's able to grow more rapidly with lower concentrations of tryptophan. So basically it eats down the concentration of tryptophan to where Pseudomonas can't even access it, or at least not access it well, and then it, it makes ecological hay and, and wins this competition. The point of this is just to illustrate how hard it is to keep multiple species together um, at stable population sizes, and also to think about the various different properties that might influence the outcomes of these competitions. So let's take this one step further and then apply it to the diverse carbohydrates specifically, but then broader nutrient sources available in the context of the colon. So we think very much about the context of dietary fibers or plant polysaccharides, and their various different structures, and they might, there are various different conformations that might be present inside the colon. But there's also a lot of other kinds of, of polysaccharides available, some production of microbial glycans that occurs in the context of the colon, then also consumption of those glycans. There are milk oligosaccharides for those who are eating dairy, um, whether that be breastfeeding or dairy consumption. There are residues of meat that are not particularly well digested by humans. And then finally, there are endogenous glycans that we produce that microbes lacking the rest of these glycans in easy access might consume in a very significant way, or at least a faster rate than we synthesize them. And then that would be potentially dangerous for the, the barrier between the gut microbes and us. And so this idea is we always have this interplay in this mixed combination of glycans that are coming down the pike. And then microbes are responding to that environment in a very a fast and low, I would say, uh, very, very rapid adaptation cycle there. So microbes um, are actually quite rational consumers of carbohydrates. And so as we think about this in the terminal ileum and the cecum, when these resistant carbohydrates reach the, you know, the end of the ileum and the colon, there's intense competition for all of those kinds of, of resources that are easy to access. And what that means is for the microbes, they have to invest less energy in order to gain more energy. So they have a much higher reward to risk profile for these, meaning they have to synthesize fewer enzymes or transporters. They have to do less work in order to access soluble, easily fermented glycans like inulins, for example, or some, some resistant dextrins. And as those are exhausted, so this competition rapidly exhausts that, microbes have to switch their behavior. So then they have to start to do things that are much harder colonizing things like insoluble particles and synthesizing enzymes that are required to disrupt cell wall structures. So there's, there's, a, there's this gradient that we wanna keep in mind that every time we are thinking about the colon, we're talking about competitions that are not the same at various different regions of the colon. So 
um, you know, even though we think and talk about fecal samples because they're really easy to access and, and it would be impossible to do the work at the scale that we're able to do it with any kind of upper uh, either colonic or small intestinal sample as the origin. We have to keep that this keep in mind that this longitudinal gradient exists. And so what we're seeing coming out may be very, very different from what we see actually being abundant and active in the cecum. So one thing that we're really interested in and paying close attention to with respect to fermentation of fibers is what kind of uh, outputs metabolically those have on humans. And so um, the short chain fatty acids, which are the terminal product of microbial fermentation of fibers by and large, are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And each of those is known to impact human physiology very substantially. Here is with metabolism in the liver, things like fatty acid oxidation and lipid buffering uh, gluconeogenesis are controlled by, at least in part, the abundances of these different short chain fatty acids that are gut produced. Also, we have significant influences on the immune system. So here's a schematic showing you how a dendritic cell might respond to an antigen produced by B. fragilis in the colon. Um, the fate of this interaction between this antigen, which should be inflammatory or pro-inflammatory in this context, by the dendritic cell is modulated by what the concentrations of short chain fatty acids are. And so Butyrate, for example, could be influencing the dendritic cell activation state directly, or it might be influencing things like how it presents the antigen to the T cells, or even the development of the T cells into regulatory T cells, or Tregs here, which produce anti-inflammatory cytokines. So the point of this is that short-chain fatty acids, not just on metabolism, are also throttling our inflammatory milieu, not, it, not just in the gut, certainly in the gut, uh, where a very large fraction of the immune system resides, but then also throughout the entire body. So when we think about how can you produce more short chain fatty acids, we're stuck with a situation where now all of a sudden mechanism for diversity can start to become more apparent. In the sense that if you have a high diversity diet, where you're eating lots of different dietary carbohydrates, but you have a low diversity of microbiota, the access that these microbes have to the carbohydrates you're eating is limited because they only have so much genetic potential to consume certain carbohydrates and certain carbohydrate structures. So in this case, in this example, we have green microbe here and green microbe eats black spiral carbohydrate. And so there are two ways to really improve the overall production of short chain fatty acids by the this, this system. Either we can decrease the, the diversity of fibers we're eating, so we eat only or predominantly black spiral so that green microbe can turn that into its favorite short chain fatty acid, in this case is propionate, or we can increase the microbial diversity or, or continue to make a and recruit a diverse microbiome that has the ability to capture more carbohydrate because it has the ability to hydrolyze different linkages and ferment those to diverse metabolic end products. So when we think about this, the impact of having high diversity via short chain fatty acids is actually pretty significant. And we'll see an example of that um, at the end of this talk. The problem with this is that Americans are really bad at eating their fiber. And, and probably everybody who's on this call knows that, that um, Americans, we're getting about 40 to 60% of our dietary reference intake for fiber on average. It may look like males are doing a little bit better. The reality is they're just eating more. So they consume a greater absolute amount of fiber, but with, with respect to their DRI, they're not doing any better than females. In fact, females are slightly doing better. But um, this is thinking about fiber as a big category. Remember, we talked about the different molecular structures early on and how they might have differential influences on the gut microbiome. This is what consumers are getting. They're getting one line um, on their nutrition facts panel that says dietary fiber, which is a huge um, summation of all the possible plant structures. And if they're lucky, maybe they got soluble and insoluble fiber on their nutrition facts panel label. And that's all they have to make decisions on. They don't know what are the, the um, you know, differential impacts of different fiber structures. And so what that leads to is very fundamentally practical advice that could be dietarily very wrong. And, and this is not to, to um, poke fun at, at, at uh, Ms. Song, but rather the idea here is this is fundamentally um, practical advice if all fibers behave the same way. If soluble and insoluble fibers exert the same influence on the gut microbiome and exert the same health benefits, then the best fiber for you is the one that you will actually eat. But what if there are some differences in how certain fibers influence the gut microbiome in different ways? Are there ways to supplant this kind of fiber gap by increasing the amount of 
of really highly active fibers, highly active fibers that have very high activity and that can substitute for a large bulk of perhaps low, low fibers, low activity fibers, which might be categorized here on the labels. And so of course, this is what everybody's looking for. And this is you know, some, some incontrovertible video evidence of that. So apparently um, there is a, a one daily serving of fiber that will reduce your weight by 340%. And this is what everybody's looking for, this highly specific interaction of fiber and gut microbes that has a specific physiological outcome. And so where does my lab interface with this? So what we do is we're interested in the fundamental properties of complex carbohydrates that govern how microbes will function in the gut microbiome and also which microbes are successful and which aren't. And so our null hypothesis here is that there are no generalities in fiber microbiota interactions. Everything is idiosyncratic either to fibers, which behave all differently, or to microbes because of their genomes being divergent, they all behave differently. And so therefore there's nothing that we can learn that we can generalize across different fibers. Our hypothesis is we really hope that that's not true. Um, we hope that there are general ecological strategies that microbes are using to gain advantage with respect to different fermentation of fiber. And you can think about many different kinds of properties that that could be. So that could be which fibers they hydrolyze, what they transport, how they regulate those genes. And then, you know, when they see certain fibers, how fast they grow or what their affinity is, these are all things that are hard coded into microbial genomes, but that could be generalized across different fiber types. If it's true that these generalities do exist, they give us a foundation potentially for engineering fibers and for engineering foods for predictable gut microbiome outcomes, which is something that means we could exert control over health that via diet um, at population scales, if, if these things are actually possible to understand. If not, we're playing Pokemon and you gotta, you gotta test every single fiber. Um, and for people like me, that's great job security, but it's a really depressing kind of uh, scenario we would find ourselves in uh, because the number of molecular structures of plants, it, even those that are common in the diet, is astronomically large. So uh, that would be several sequential careers worth of work in order to do anything of this magnitude. So what kinds of fiber structures influence microbiome outcomes? Let's start first with a vignette on some insoluble fibers. And this is something that we noticed really early and started testing, um, which is that westernization of diet uh, is not just decreased with total fiber, uh, associated with decreased total fiber intake, but rather it changes how the form of that fiber intake is manifest in the diet. So as, as cultures western, westernize, the efficiency by which they produce small particles, and, and humans tend to prefer small particles in sensories, sensory examination, so um, they get small particles uh, by and large from the industry. And so therefore, the, the efficiency of producing that goes from traditional methods of, of doing that to the brutal efficiency of the roller mill. And so these, these processes are very efficient at producing very small particles. And so we wondered to what extent does that um, influence gut microbiome structure and function? And so I'll spare you the, we published a paper on this in scientific reports um, using a directly sieved. So we, we received a batch of bran from a miller and we sieved it out. And then we were able to, um, to separate microbial responses based on size. There were some differences there. But one of the things that was a correlate of that was that we had very different amounts of glucose. And we, we attributed that to starch contamination in our, um, in our particles. And we, that was mechanistically causing some trouble. So we redid the experiment again, and we took the largest bran fraction that we had, which is the greater than 1700 micron fraction. And we milled that further and sieved it out into the same, essentially the same um, ranges of different particle sizes as we had the first time. And we, what we found is we were able to eliminate that glucose effect. So we don't have any statistically significant differences among glucose concentrations um, of these various particles, but we didn't eliminate complete uh, chemical variability here. What you can see here is the arabinose to xylose ratio. Here, arabinose is in red and xylose is in green actually decreases, the, the, the ratio decreases with increasing size meaning that the larger particles by and large have more, they have uh, less arabinose per unit xylose than the small ones do. And what that arabinose to xylose ratio is indicating really is how branched their arabinoxylan polymers are. And arabinoxylans make up about 50% of brands. So there's a lot of fiber tied up in these particular polysaccharide molecules. And so what we were seeing is that 
looked like there were some preferential breakpoints which caused small particles to be easily produced with high branch density Arabinus islands. And we wanted to know, would we still see the same phenotype that we observed the first time? And the answer was we did. And we, we saw a very um, encouraging response for somebody who's interested in understanding some generalizable properties and principles of interaction. So here you're looking at different particle sizes by the colors of the rainbow here, where short wavelengths are, are small, par small particles and long wavelengths are large particles. And what you can see is that there is an inverse relationship between propiogenesis and butyrogenesis that is associated with particle size. So the smallest particles were much more highly propiogenic than the large particles were, and vice versa, the small particles were much less butyrogenic than the large particles were. And so this is the same kind of relationship we observed the first time, so we were gratified to see it again in, in a way that was a little more controlled and free of um, contaminating glucose. And further, we saw organisms that sorted based upon their size preferences. And so in this case, not only did we look at overall just the, the community in small and large particles together, but we separated those, um, those microbes that were suspended in the culture, floating around, versus those that were physically attached to the particle. And so the particle attached organisms are there in the hatched bars and the open bars are there. Uh, those are the supernatant suspended organisms. What you can see is that these organisms have very different preferences, even within the three Bacteroides species that I'm showing you here. Operational taxonomic units here, OTU, stands for a computational analog of species, which is the best we can do with sequence data. But um, they're approximately the same scale, we think, in terms of their, their range of species level categorization. So this OTU2 bacteroides likes small particles a lot, um, much more than it does the larger particles in general, but it tends to prefer being, being suspended than attached. Vice versa with the OTU7 plebeus, the OTU7 bacteroides plebeus loves small particles, happily attaches to them, um, but is not found nearly as frequently in, in suspension. So we see these very different behaviors where some microbes are attaching, and consuming the particle directly and some microbes are suspended and consuming presumably metabolic products of those that are physically attached. So soluble fibers or insoluble fibers influence microbiome structure in, or in terms of their fine structure. Uh, what about soluble hemicelluloses? And so in order to do this experiment, we isolated arabinoxylan polymers from hard red spring, hard red winter and soft red winter wheats and these were pretty similar in structure. You can see some structural models associated with what we calculated from linkage analysis data of those extracts. Um, basically, hard red spring and hard red winter wheat were very, very similar in structure. Soft red winter wheat arabinoxylan was slightly different. It was increasingly branched and a little more, um, and, but only a little more so. So not, not a ton different, these two molecules. But we wanted to know whether or not this was going to have an influence on fermentation. And so Eunice uh, Tunchel and Rhea Thacker, um, the dynamic duo that really helped our lab get, it, get started, were responsible for doing this, um, doing this experiment where they fermented these different arabinoxylans with the same initial microbiota to see whether or not they would ferment differently. And it turns out they, in fact, do ferment differently. So you get overall higher short-chain fatty acid production from the hard red varieties in green and blue. And the, the orange variety there, soft red winter wheat, uh, produces overall less short chain fatty acid and does so more slowly. And specifically, it produces less butyrate than the others do. And you can see that kind of um, with respect to the 48 hour time point. Those are to clarify a little bit the endpoints there because it's hard to see those error bars. But um, it produces markedly less butyrate, but it produces actually statistically significantly more propionate which suggests that there was something going on that was different in these cultures than we originally observed. So we wondered whether or not these microbes were actually different in these different um, communities. So what we did was we did 16S analysis of these communities as we had before for the particles, um, the wheat bran particles, and we found that indeed soft red winter wheat or Avanozylan clusters all by itself where the hard red and hard red winter and hard red spring communities are going together their own separate direction. So these communities are distinct in terms of their uh, the population's relative abundances of different microbes. And so we can see that these different Arabinus islands were selective for different communities. And so we wondered what specific communities were being selected by these different ones, different uh, structures, fine structures. We find that the, the difference is driven mostly by 
a Prevotella bacteroides competition, where the hard red varieties were much more selective for Prevotella, this OTU2 Prevotella here, and the soft red varieties were more selective for bacteroides in general, so OTU1 certainly, but also OTU5. And then there are other microbes that show you a similar pattern. For example, this OTU9 Lactnosporaceae member is a, it tends to prefer the hard varieties, where this Rosburia species prefers the softer varieties. And if you look at that from a statistical point of view, we did linear discriminant analysis and found that there were definitely statistically significant associations of different microbes with different sizes of, uh, or sorry, different hardness or softness of arabinoxylane here. So in this case, you're looking at uh, the bacteroides, which are preferring generally the soft wheat arabinoxylanes and Prevotella preferring the hard. And then here's that lactnosporaceae member, which we see over here, the Rosburia, which prefers soft. So we wondered then, okay, so these polymers are big, they're very structurally compl complicated, and so what that allows or might allow is that organisms to just take parts of these molecules, and they might be able to clip off certain regions and use those to their advantage instead of just um, simply consuming the whole polymer, even though some of these, some organisms can consume the entire arabinoz island, for example, like Bacteroides ovatus, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So what we wondered was, if you give a community, a mixed community, a structured polysaccharide, would that allow microbes to maintain diversity because they're able to divide labor in consuming that polysaccharide and not compete with each other? So what we did is we put them on a treadmill. We put them on a microbial treadmill where we were diluting them one to 100 every day. And what we were really doing is engineering evolutionary bottlenecks. So you have to be a one percenter in order to make it to the next generation. So statistically speaking, if you're, an organism that's not growing well in this environment, you're going to be diluted out pretty rapidly. We took our fecal inocula, and just like Ghostbusters, the streams never cross, so these lines keep on going straight down where we do passage after passage after passage, and we're enriching for those organisms that are most effective at consuming the carbohydrate we, we gave them. And so we use two model polymers, one is the um, is an inulin, which was an, oligos an oligosaccharide, which uh, was very simple in structure and pretty low in molecular weight, an average DP of a degree of polymerization of five. And we use sorghum arabinose island as a model polysaccharide because it's very much more evenly su substituted across the entire uh, length of the molecule. And this is work done by a former postdoc in my lab, Ming Su Chen and Tian Ming Yao, who's a current graduating uh, student in my lab. So we asked whether or not these these different structures would maintain diversity over sequential passages. And what we find, found out is that yes, indeed, different, uh, the structured polymer here, the sorghum arabinose island was really quite good at maintaining diversity over passages. So here you're looking at different passages in terms of days, so one up to seven. And then we have inulin and we have the um, sorghum arabinose island. And those are provided against controls that that emulate the composition of the molecule. Uh, in this case, inulin is being controlled for with fructose, although it's, there's a little bit of glucose there. And then sorghum arabinose island is controlled with a, a sugar mix that emulates the composition, the sugar composition of the molecule. What we can see is that structured carbohydrates maintain, maintain diversity over sequential passages. And then the second question we asked was, is it, is it only the, the carbohydrate structure that's doing this, or is it the fact that we put these communities in a very austere nutritional environment where they have to do all the work themselves. They have to make all of their own amino acids, all of their own vitamins. They have to do it all from scratch, which is not all that similar to the colon. This is a theoretical ecology experiment after all. So what we did is we we substituted um, the media and sorry, amended the media with amino acids and vitamins and did the same experiment again with the same donor one month later. And what we found is Yes, indeed, um, it's the polysaccharide that is structuring carbohydrate, the, the, the relationship. Even though we were able to maintain more diversity when we supplemented here with our amino acids and vitamins, we were able to maintain a, so statistically significantly higher diversity um, on the sorghum arabinose island than for the inulins. And further, when we supplement, supplemented the inulins, the diversity that we observed went down. So um, the inulins were actually less diverse when supplemented than, than more diverse. Um, interestingly enough, these conditions here, the red lines, are actually the same condition over the second month. So there's, there's definitely a sampling time effect here in the, in the gut microbiome of this particular individual. Although if you supplement, uh, in the second case, that 
curve looks very similar to the one that we observed the first time, which suggests that maybe there's a, an effect of the fecal sample here in, in terms of um, how it influences fecal fermentations. That's actually something that we need to pay attention to as a field. So the you know, PSA on that is um, we're probably going to need to think more about the state of the feces when we're putting them into fecal fermentations and how those different nutritional environments specifically might influence some of these outcomes. Just to show you what that looks like in terms of the community space with sequential days. So if you have um, single sugars or mixed sugars almost um, completely dominated by Klebsiella pneumoniae, and then um, inulins are also very dominated by Klebsiella pneumoniae with a few uh, Bacteroides and Clostridale populations that, hangs, that hang on. So there's some maintained diversity up here. And if you are interested in this uh, effect, I'm happy to, I, I'm not gonna say more about it right now, Happy to answer questions about it later though. So um, in contrast, the sorghum rabbit as island community is, is dominated by Bacteroides ovatus, which makes sense. We know this organism has all of the genes required to degrade Arabinus islands completely. But interestingly, sort of the B. ovatus doesn't outcompete all the other members here in this community. In fact, it shares the labor with other members here that um, can participate in degrading this fiber, um, either indirectly or directly. This looks very similar, of course, or at least much more similar to, there's certainly an expansion in the Bacteroides population here, but pretty similar to the initial fecal sample in terms of which organisms are there. And in the second case of supplementing these communities with extra nutrients, what we find is that supplementing inulin cultures completely changed the outcome. So the Klebsiella culture, when we didn't supplement in the ND here, or normal buffered medium, um, was supplanted by E. coli and bifidobacterium when we fortified. So this is a really interesting relationship where we completely change the outcome here uh, if we fortify with other types of nutrients. But for the Arabinus islands, we're able to maintain some more diversity, especially in the Firmicutes here when we supplement. But the reality is most of the same organisms here are represented here. We don't see wholesale change in which organisms are, are wildly abundant and which ones aren't. So the conclusion here from this is that it's the carbohydrate not the other nutrients that are controlling the community structure here, although some other nutrients definitely help. So last vignette, and then we'll land the plane. Um, talk a little bit about resistant glucans. And the reason we're interested in resistant glucans is because with all the previous examples we showed you, um, composition varies with different source. So yeah, um, fruct a polyfructose is not the same as a, a xylan backbone with a rabinose. The constituents are not the same, the sugars are not the same, and that can have different impacts. And so what we wanted to do is use a system which had some dietary relevance, but was entirely composed of glucose. So we needed some resistant glucans. And so in this case, we looked for um, resistant dextrins, which as you all know, are very easily hydrolyzed by human enzymes, but have lots of nice hydroxyl groups that we can substitute other glucose residues to make these uh, resistant to degradation by human enzymes. And then of course, um, the polydextroses, which are random polymers of glucose, which can have many different structural conformations. And our hypothesis here was that we were trying to determine whether or not different, different structures um, were specific for different microbiota and that would, whether that would be true independent of variation in the composition of the molecules. So Ariana Romero, who just graduated with a master's in my lab, um, did a lot of hard work trying to determine whether commercial sources of resistant glucans were in fact different in their structure. And what she determined is absolutely different production processes generate very different structures. So backbone um, linkages here are represented in tans and, and, and grays and black. Um, singly branched linkages are represented in pinks and then multiple branched linkages here are represented in blues. And what this shows is that there was definite structural variation among the glucans in her trial. And so it's suggested it would be a reasonable substrate for our, uh, our work in looking at how microbes might respond to these. So Ariana took the panel of resistant glucans and she fermented them with three different donors microbiota. And she did that in batch anaerobic fermentation. And over time, she measured short chain fatty acid production at the end of the fermentation. She measured community structure using the 16S ribosomal RNA as we talked about before. And so the interesting first observation was that metabolic outcomes um, in terms of short chain fatty acid production were individual and they were emergent, meaning that um, different donors microbiota perform very differently with respect to different um, short chain fatty acid production. So acetogenesis, and if you look at the pattern, um, 
the pattern of acetogenesis in, in all these different carbohydrates was pretty similar, except donor two's microbiome was wildly more acetogenic on everything. And so interestingly enough, donor two is our highest donor initial diversity donor. So that goes back to the previous thought about short chain fatty acid production and then initial diversity and how those might interact with carbohydrate diversity. But when you look at butyrate and propionate, these um, we see a trade-off here between butyrate and propiogenesis, butyrate production and propiogenesis, in that the mixed linkage alpha-glucans were wildly butyrogenic for donor two microbiota, but the other glucans we were looking at, the resistant maltodextrins and polydextroses, were actually more butyrogenic in donor one microbiota. Contrast was true for, propi or for propionate here. Propionate was wildly produced by donor two microbiota in donor one microbiota, um, much less so uh, for, for these resistant maltodextrins. But actually, propiogenesis was higher for the mixed linkage alpha-glucans for donor for the donor one microbiota than it was for the rest of them. It suggests that overall, the, the fiber is not what's controlling the short-chain fatty acid here. It's the fiber microbiome interaction that determines what the metabolic output will be. And that's um, suggestive that there are specific linkages that might be influential. But identifying what those commonalities are is really hard because all of the fermentations look like very strongly like what their initial donor microbiota look like. So there's, the fermentations are much more similar um, to, e, to the initial donor than they are with respect to conditions. And so, you know, again, this is not to have you squint and look and see, oh man, can I pick something out of a lineup? It's really just to illustrate how challenging it is to find using simple abundance measurements, um, which, which microbes are the most influential in responding to a certain condition because everyone is starting from a different location. But despite this reality, different taxonomic groups showed preferences across the individuals for specific glucan classes and specific glucan structures. So what does that mean? It means that, you know, if we look at genus Bacteroides, which is right here, if you look at the level of in individual classes, some members of Bacteroides prefer polydextroses and some prefer resistant maltodextrins, whereas Parabacteroides prefers polydextroses, for example. And in, in Lactospiraceae over here, it's a mixed bag. So, you know, that's, that shows you this is not just selective for bacteroides, it depends specifically on which bacteroides you are. And then if you look at the level of individual glucans, that becomes even more finely resolved. So certainly bacteroides are most enriched with the glucan G, which is a resistant maltodextrin, but one species prefers resistant maltodextrin, resistant, resistant maltodextrin M. And specifically, we can see parabacteroides here prefers polydextrose E, whereas there's, you know, differentiation within lactospiraceae for which polydextrose is preferred. So um, there are statistically significant relationships across all of the individuals in terms of these responses. And so maybe the easiest way for humans to visualize this is with respect to growth rates. And so what we did is we measured relative abundances of organisms after fermentation to their initial growth or their initial abundance before fermentation. And so that we're, we're representing here Log two, transform, log two transformed full change in the relative abundances after fermentation. And so what that means is that numbers that are greater than zero indicate above average growth rates, and numbers that are below zero or blue here indicate low average growth rates. And what you can see from these data is that these organisms perform very, very differently depending on their microbiome of, of origin. So some of them, you know, perform very strongly. What I usually like to do is call people's attention to, oh, there's lots of different things you could look at here. The polydextroses show you what I think is some evidence of competition. So Parabacteroides does a, a tremendous job of growing on polydextrose E and donor three, and is more muted in donor one and two, two microbiota. It does less so with respect to um, polydextrose H. Conversely, Anaerostipes here is really, really good at consuming polydextrose H, but only in donor one's microbiome. In donor three's microbiome, it doesn't seem to do much at all. And in contrast, we can see that Fusicatenibacter is pretty much an equal opportunity consumer of polydextroses, except, except when OTU1 Anaerostipes is really abundant. In that case, Anaerostipes in donor one's microbiome seems to outcompete both Parabacteroides and Fusicatenibacter for these. So this suggests, again, that there are some uh, microbiome and context-dependent interactions which govern the outcomes of these competition events. And so you, know, you can see that also with the Bacteroides, and I'll, I'll show you that on the second screen here. Oh, yeah, my point, right, I think I already said it, but fiber structure, both in fiber structure and community context matter a bunch here. So um, just to kind of, with the last data slide here, show you that 
the responses at the genus level are really different depending on the donor of origin. So these are members of Blaudia and Bacteroides. We chose them because we have good coverage of this. We have many OTUs within these and we can see differences in their pattern. What you can see is that uh, although there are some generalizable responses, there's also a very significant specificity based on the microbiome of origin. That these patterns are pretty different in some cases. And so what that suggests is either that these strains are different, they actually have different function for different individuals, possible, or that interactions with other organisms are governing who is successful and who's not. And the abundances of those other organisms and their metabolic interactions might matter. So to land the plane, um, I'd like to, to think about is that all brand particles maybe aren't equal with respect to their interactions with microbiota. And so uh, how we generate them and process them might matter. That's a focus of an ongoing USDA grant in my lab. Um, subtle differences in soluble fiber structure could strongly influ influence interactions with the microbiome. And so certainly we have more information on this that I haven't had time to tell you about today, but it's looking like this is very strongly true. Um, complex carbohydrates are able to maintain stable diversity, even though uh, Gauss's law has not been repealed. And com community metabolism uh, is emergent with respect to the resistant glucans, but the, those glucans are selective for common OTUs across individuals. So finally, what's the hope? We, the hope is we're able to mill and mix brand particles and soluble fibers and exert targeted impacts on the gut microbiome, either through metabolic output or short-chain fatty acids or with respect to certain population sizes of organisms. And so with that, I'll thank you for your time and your attention. I appreciate uh, you joining uh, for this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever it is, whatever it is where you are. Um, I'd like to thank the people who did the work, most of whom you've, um, you've met, but I'd like to call out the people you haven't met. Dr. Ashwana Fricker is helping us with some um, particle size, using some metagenomics of these particle size communities to determine what makes an organism good at being particle attached or being good at fermenting a large versus a small particle. Um, Denise Velasco and Renee Olis really helped quite a bit on the glucan study in, in generating figures and doing the experiments. And then Bruce Hamaker and Brad Ruse have taught me to speak carbohydrate chemistry as a second language, which is hard to teach a microbial ecologist, but I'm learning slowly. Um, and then also finally to thank our funders for this work, Army Research Office and our consortium of industrial partners helped us with the funding the glucan study and the USDA is funding the brand work. And so um, with that, I'll take any questions you might have.